Rescue 117 is the Irish Coast Guard's rescue helicopter based at Waterford Airport. For six months, RTE cameras have followed this unit as they battle against the elements to save lives. On this episode of Rescue 117, the search for a missing man. The problem is if you're cold, you try and get undercover under trees. Stranded, a woman trapped by the incoming tide. And a risky rescue on the Camera Mountains. Let's just get out of here. All right. It's a quiet Sunday afternoon at the Irish Coast Guard base in Waterford. Captain Mark McDermott briefs the crew on his plan for the day's training. In County Wexford, holidaymaker Maeve Markey decides to go for a walk along the seashore. When she doesn't return after a number of hours, her family become concerned. But by late evening, Maeve is still missing, and a call is put into the Waterford helicopter base to help with the search. Just after 10 o'clock at night, we were called by the Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre up to a report of a missing woman who had uh, apparently gone for a walk in the afternoon and had not returned. The crew are aware that time is of the essence. On duty is pilot Mark McDermott, co-pilot Martin Rayner, and winchman Mike Sandover. It was a very poor day. There had been a very low fog and cloud and drizzle all day. So the first challenge was actually getting on scene. We immediately went into cloud about 200 feet and climbed up to a high level to route across to the east coast. Maeve has now been missing for eight hours. As night falls, the prospects of finding her alive decrease. The crew of Rescue 117 deploy their FLIR camera. The FLIR camera is basically a heat-seeking camera on pitch black nights. It's basically a, a tool for searching for people that are giving off uh, body heat. The infrared camera can spot heat sources from up to 10 miles away. We could see the blue flashing lights of the police cars and the Coast Guard vehicles that had started the search and we made the decision to come a bit north of there just to get the aircraft set up. We allow ourselves to come into wind because it means we can come in nice and slow. We have a bigger on flare and she is now waving on the nose. Really? That's somebody waving at us on the nose. Good man. We knew quite quickly that she was quite distressed and needed to be brought out of there. Uh, the tide was washing in very close up to the base of the cliffs and she was basically pinned back against the cliffs. Um, so once we'd actually located her, um, we moved into a different mode, the rescue mode. 60 feet above, the helicopter hovers a safe distance from the cliff. Full power you've got. Okay, full power. And cleared off. With the tide coming in, every second counts as Maeve is beginning to panic. The helicopter descends from 60 feet to 40 feet, so winchman Mike Sandover can descend to the scene. But something unexpected happens which puts the rescue in jeopardy. It didn't go quite according to plan. She actually started to walk out into the sea. By running into the sea, Maeve is making a near-fatal error. She can easily be picked up and swept away by the thundering waves. To keep her safe, Mike must get the woman back to the shoreline as fast as possible. If she would continued coming into the sea, she could have got into difficulty very quickly. The shoreline shelves off quite steeply there and there were some quite big waves coming in. The roar of the helicopter engines makes communication difficult.
Uh, Roger, we have the okay, casualty safety on board. board. She is okay, a bit cold, but uh, looks not the worst way from that. Later, back at Rescue 117's base, Maeve Markey realises just how lucky she was. You thought for a while we hadn't seen you, did you? <laughs> this is my last class to be alive. Yeah, we actually have, um, we have an infrared camera, so you, we saw okay, you very so easily, cool. actually. Take, take your time, Amy. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful. Not at all. see a wave hitting up nearly halfway up the cliff. Unbelievable stuff. Like I just sat there and I prayed that somebody would find me. I ran out first, thinking, you know, to let them know I was, still, I was there and I needed to get out of here. And he said, go back. So I went back and it exactly was told, you know. So he said, hold on tight, and that was it. Extremely grateful. The Waterford base has been open since 2002. Chief pilot Dara Fitzpatrick has been flying for over 20 years. It's lunchtime, and winch operator Neville is cooking up a culinary delight. We need six tuna for various crush. Okay. Yes, Mum. Dara is one of only a few female civilian rescue pilots in the world. When I come back, we were all messing around in the crew room. Like, I'm well aware. I'm in a nearly a men's locker room situation at times. But I have to admit, that's where the lads are so good. Like, they cut down the jokes. Um, they, they're very respectful, they're very courteous. If you were a gentleman, Mark, you actually would have done this for me. Like, chivalry and all that stuff, you know? If you were a lady, you would have waited for me to do it. <laughs> oh, too shy. <laughs> I might be waiting a while though, that's the only thing. I don't really want to be treated like a man here and I do appreciate that an awful lot of the time, you know. And the Coast Guard as well, I think. The Coast Guard has just never been an issue. It's like, here's the standard. Whether you're male or female, you have to get to that standard. End of story, 100% of the time. Mm. Very nice. We like pigeon pate. It's a sunny afternoon, perfect weather for hill walking. The crew know on a day like this they could get a call out at any time. It's not long before the team are called to the Cumara Mountains. On duty is pilot Dara Fitzpatrick, co-pilot Peter Mackenzie Brown, winch operator Neil McAdam and winchman Keith Devaney. Okay, and I'll set the back. All set. Okay, and left it fully forward please. Roger. Well, that's a nice diversion from the training trip anyway. Absolutely. Okay, Rescue 117 is now airborne from Waterford. The initial request came in from Southeastern Mountain Rescue Service. A woman faller stranded in the Cumshingon uh, area of the Comer Mountains and that she'd been there for a considerable amount of time. The longer she's on the side of the mountain with the deteriorating weather, you would then consider hypothermia to start setting in. Brief. Uh, brief, we're going to go assess the area to find the casualty and the MR and then we'll make it from there. There was some really, really, really heavy showers coming in. They were kind of, they were kind of infrequent when they came in, they were really, really heavy. So we were aware of that and we were planning to just kind of stay away from those. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go slightly to the north, we're going to come right to the left, putting the lake and everything on the right. So Updated wind is a westerly straight out of the gully. You can see the cats pulls in the back. Mountain top winds can be extremely dangerous for helicopters. One thing we were conscious of was the wind direction. She was in the lee of the mountain. So basically where the wind was coming in, it was coming over the mountain, it was from the west, it was coming over the mountain, coming round, and it would be really, really turbulent and really, really dirty air at the point that she was. So we knew we were going to have a little bit of difficulty there. You'll never go into the lead of a hill like that, just something you just don't do. It's just being slapped by downdrafting air all the time and that's your problem. So we just wouldn't really tend to go in there. We don't have a choice on a day like that. Just gonna try and kick it here just for a second, try and find find the wind. Look a breeze through the windows there, isn't there? Yeah. 85%. 95. Yeah, oh, it's not like 100. No, 100% flying away. Yeah, it doesn't like that now. Flying away, 100%. Watch that. Dara's priority is to make the helicopter safe. So the turbines was just throwing the helicopter around. And the engines are having to work to the maximum to try and keep the helicopter in the air just because purely the air is coming down and slapping on top of it. 
we sat in the hover there and suddenly Pete would say to me, he was watching the torque, which is the power of the engines, and he'd say to me, 100% fly away. The engines are at their maximum, they can't stay up. So we had to fly away, dive down, get airspeed and come back round again. The turbulence is getting stronger and the weather makes visibility very poor. Dara is unable to get a good visual reference for winching. She decides co-pilot Peter Mackenzie Brown is in a better position to see Keith winch safely to the ground or to see a safe flyaway path in the event of an engine failure. Okay, Peter, I'm gonna hand it over to you and see if you can find anything yeah, that's not working fair. from my side. Okay, just keep going, coming right. There's about three or four units. Well, I'm trying to do is put more ground or anything here, you know? Yeah. How's yeah. your power up here? About 80, 80 to 85%. Okay. 100%. Right, Keith's just getting on his polycom here. Okay, once we drop Keith, we'll um, uh, yeah, go get out of the way, eh? Yeah, we'll definitely get out of here. Okay guys, checking this gear. This gear is good. Just let me know what you want, stretch or straps. Just put it up here. Ah, check clear to winch. You clear to winch, man. Ah, we should have And he's out the door this time. I think my concern there was that uh, we'd be in the middle of winching Keith down. We'd get a really, really bad slap of downdrafting. The power would go up and we'd have to fly away and Keith is still attached. So that's, that's the danger, that's what we're afraid of at all times. Keith is some distance from the casualty, as it is the safest place for him to land. The crew on the helicopter are still being buffeted about by the high winds. Let's just get out of here. Semra, the Southeast Mountain Rescue Association, are already on site with first aid. They have assessed that casualty Maggie Doyle has broken an ankle. They brief Keith. Hi guys. Hi, how do you? How do you? Could you send me down the stretcher, please? The stretcher. Much happy. There's your wind. Look at the cap yeah. balls. It takes all the pilot's skill and experience to keep the helicopter steady. Roger, straight through position. Um, we should have built. What position, lads? The wind is making it quite a uh, tricky yeah. little monkey. The risk of hypothermia increases the longer Maggie is left on the side of the mountain. Oh, 100% flyaway. Okay, you're clear to go. Roger. Flying away. There we go. Just a little downdraft. Maggie Doyle later made a full recovery. We were probably a bit under pressure up the front there as the pilots because we were worried about the engines. Uh, the weather was coming in, it was getting worse. Um, it was starting to get dark. We just didn't need any messing around there. But the mountain rescue team had the casualty ready, knew exactly what we wanted, did everything perfectly, and it just went seamlessly really after that. Coming up, the search for a missing man in Waterford City. Can't actually focus in on it. It's coming into the four o'clock. Four o'clock. Okay. Helicopter Rescue 117 is based in Waterford. RTE cameras have been following the team and their rescues as they unfold. Winch operator Neil McAdam has a lot of years' experience in search and rescue. Yeah. Uh, my role is the senior crewman, uh, I'm responsible for all training of the crewmen on the base. Today, Keith Devaney is undergoing training from winch man to winch operator. I've been a, a winch man since 2005, since I took up position in the company. So it's just natural progression now that I move on to being duly qualified. Any questions for me? It's going to be a lot of pressure for Keith. The transition from winch man to winch operator uh, is quite, it's quite a large step. It's a lot more responsibility because you're now responsible for the, the, the actual aircraft and the winch man who is the, the, the man who hangs out the aircraft. On a rescue mission, the winch operator must be able to actually fly the helicopter if the pilot does not have clear visibility. There is a joystick in the cabin which allows the winch operator to do this. So it's the first time actually um, controlling the aircraft using the AHT joystick. So um, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a tough enough uh, sortie for him. The time has come. It's now Keith's opportunity to fly the helicopter. He must let the helicopter hover using a buoy as a reference. 
forward two, forward one. Hold not target and steady. Successful at this part of the exercise, Keith moves on to the next part of training, which involves a yellow drum. The drum is used for a static winch and exercise. It basically it simulates a man in the water. Uh, what Keith is going to do is he's going to use this grapple hook, which will be attached to the hoist hook, and uh, throw and snag the drum through one of the ropes there. By hooking the drum, this simulates the winch operator guiding the winch man to the casualty in the water. Keith must fly the helicopter with the joystick as well as operate the hoist. Steady. Steady. Hook is engaged in the drum. Oh yeah. Hook has the drum. Drum is clear to water. Do we can call it a day. Yeah. Roger, winch again. Go forward there, Keith. Keith has made it look easy, but he won't get any praise from Neil just yet, as they both know that there are a lot more difficult challenges ahead. The helicopter crew are constantly training for every eventuality and often they are called out midway through a training exercise. On duty is pilot Mark McDermott, co-pilot Lee Bennett, winch operator Neville Murphy and winchman Mike Sandover. On this particular morning we've been to the south of the airfield on the coast to an area where we normally practice our uh, cliff winching exercises. And we had completed that exercise when we were alerted by the Rescue Coordination Centre to an incident in Waterford City of a missing person. An elderly man has been reported missing for the last 10 hours and concerns for his well-being are growing. So we immediately returned to the base, we refuelled. They want us to look at the area uh, towards the Woodlands Hotel from the hospital. And, uh, Along the river? Along the river as well, just that general area, the hospital area, okay. any woodland scrub area that they can get into. We have the civil defence and the guards on board uh, on scene at the moment, and the Coast Guard unit from the Maurice are on the way. Okay, happy. We were airborne within nine minutes of the initial call, and because we are so close to Waterford, we were actually on scene within two minutes. From our point of view, it was a search in an urban area, which is a little bit out of the ordinary for us but we were tasked to go and search with the FLIR camera, which is the heat-seeking camera. Obviously, flying over a city it brings its own challenges. We have to think of the safety of those on the grounds. We're in a very large aircraft, and we have to make sure that the profile we fly is such that we're not going to hazard anyone uh, on the ground. Okay, just looking at uh, all the wooded area down here and down along the river, I presume, just that general. Okay, it's quite a bit of area, so what I'll do is I'll run up along this side, I'll go around the back and then we'll come back and do the, uh, the, the, the shore. It's very difficult to spot a person from the air who's on the ground, especially if that person is not moving. The infrared camera can obviously pick up these people very easily, as long as they've got a reasonable amount of heat in their body. So you're I'm like picking up a heat source on the floor in the two o'clock low. Can't actually focus in on it, it's the coming board. into the four o'clock. Four o'clock, okay. Because one of the restrictions and the problems of the infrared camera is it can't see very well through dense foliage. So we called the ground units on scene and they immediately made their way in the direction of the heat source. Now uh, one second, I, I think I actually have it on the floor now and I actually think it's the remains of a bonfire, would you believe? Okay, well we can pass it on to the ground unit in the meantime if you're happy, we'll just keep uh, dodging away around the area. As the minutes tick on, the ground crew and helicopter work together to try and locate the man, which is proving difficult in the dense woodland. The problem is if you're cold, you try and get under cover, under trees, and that's, that's all the, the uh, much, yeah. missing person stats for uh, people like him would suggest that you would crawl under very thick vegetation. Low, three o'clock now, four o'clock, very low. Okay, I have something blue, lads. Uh, just in our four o'clock. Uh, Affirm, that looks like a gentleman lying on the ground. He has a stick. Do you want to get Mike down, sir? I think so, yes. Yeah. It 
was actually a, quite an easy job to locate him on the floor. But looking at the same scene with the TV camera, it's virtually impossible to make him out. He was lying down beside a very high wall at the edge of an area of woodland. It wasn't very clear at this time how long it would take for the ground teams to get into that area. So we made the decision that I would go down on the cable uh, with a view to winching the gentleman out. OK, you'll have to go out from a high hover, Mike, but if you're happy to go, let's go. Mike, uh, your decision, back. are you happy to go? I'm happy to go. Right, right let's go then. Yep. Tell Dunbar East Coast Guard to block the road to both sides of where we are. OK, Neville, ready for you. Roger. Is this our winching height? Yes, 100 feet. OK, Mike. Checking which man's equipment, you happy to go? Double strap. Uh, brief, heading into wind, it will be right in over the casually, going to put Mike out over the top of the trees. Uh, right over the casually, pick him up and uh, straight into the aircraft. Leave that for you, mate, I'll leave that Roger. for you. Putting Mike out the door now at the time. Normally we like to keep the winchman at uh, no more than 40 feet above the ground, but on this occasion, because of the woodland and the fact that it was in an urban area, I was actually put out of the door at 150 feet away above the trees and lowered down for a little bit of a gap in the branches. So it's a lot higher than we would normally winch from. Normally we're familiar with being lowered down cliffs or maybe down between the masts and the stays on a ship, but being lowered down between lampposts and trees was a little bit of an unusual one for us. Picking up the slack, steady, steady, take them off the ground, right one and forward, just to keep away from the trees, steady now, steady, right, three just to get into the grassy area, winching out, steady, good position, steady, winching out now, winch man on the deck. We were able to bring the gentleman to a very accessible location. The ground teams were there, so they were able to provide first aid treatment and the ambulance was able to collect him from right beside the roadside. Another successful rescue for 117. This was a great job for us. We were all very pleased afterwards, partly because we'd done the job, we found the casualty, but also showed that the aircraft, when used properly, and the ground units coordinating with us well, it can have a major impact on our search. Everyone felt really chuffed at the end of it. Uh, job well done. Coming up next time on Rescue 117, an RNLI training mission goes wrong, and a kite surfer poses a real threat to the crew of Rescue 117. The uh, kite will be a concern. He's still attached, so I do think he's in a bit of bother, all right? And coming up next here on One, it's the RT News at 9, followed by Primetime.